Hello, and welcome to the SCP vs. series. Last week we did a video on SCP-173 vs. a D-Class. Through a bit of luck and a bit of talent, our intrepid D-Class managed to get out of that one alive. After sacrificing his friend, of course, but we all have to make sacrifices to get what we want. Regardless, I ran a poll on Twitter to find out who you guys wanted to see him up against next, and the answer to that was, well, Overwhelmingly, as you can see, SCP-049, the Plague Doctor. So that's what we have now. Of course, this D-Class isn't just going to go from iconic encounter to iconic encounter. He also has to deal with other, less well-known SCPs along the way. So let's see who or what he runs into first. A dark hallway filled with monsters was all Jeffrey Winters could see in front of him. He couldn't see the monsters themselves, of course, but he knew it was a safer bet to assume they were just there. There was no going back. Whatever SCP-173 had become was right behind him, scraping against the door that Winters had just shut. He took a small step forward, then another. The hallway was coming into focus now. The windows on his right overlooked an open-air office, with various cubicles in a small cluster. He could see overturned chairs, smashed desks, and a large trail of blood that went from one of the chairs out of sight under the overhang. He fumbled with the control panel on the open door for the stairs down into the office space, but it didn't respond. He tapped it with his fist once, and then he turned away. Behind him was a small storage closet, also with an open door. It looked like it was perhaps used for various members of security for the site. There were maps of the site, gas masks, tactical vests, helmets, flashlights. None of them were on the shelves. Instead, they were precariously placed in a makeshift pile in the middle of the room, like a shrine. Then, Jeffrey Winters stopped cataloging the items in front of him and turned his head slightly. The stone-on-stone -stone scraping of SCP-173 had finally quieted. He closed his eyes for a second. Nothing happened. He sighed with a slight smile. It wasn't enough for him to feel relaxed, given his circumstances, but it helped. He reached down and grabbed a vest and put it on over his orange jumpsuit. He clipped a gas mask to his side, put a map into one of his pockets, and reached for a flashlight as he heard a scream cut short just below him. A whimpering noise followed, along with the sound of crunching and slurping. Then another scream began and ended almost as quickly again followed by crunching and slurping. Jeffrey had been making more noise than he should have. It sounded like there were still people alive downstairs, or at least there had been. Hiding, he suspected. Whatever they were hiding from had probably heard him rummaging through the storage closet and, oh no, he probably needed to move. He put the flashlight into his pocket and left the closet just in time to see a lumbering creature on three knife-thin legs began to emerge from the stairs that led up from the office. The three legs terminated about halfway up the creature into a squat gray carapace shaped a bit like a turtle shell. The front and back of the shell sloped up, with the front a bit more steep than the back. The underside he could see on its front had a vaguely human face smeared in red and gore. The creature stopped at the top of the stairs and the room was completely silent except for the buzz of electricity and the clacking of the creature's teeth. Jeffrey took shallow breaths and waited, edging back into the darkness of the space just in front of the door that led back to where he had escaped SCP-173. The creature paused for a few seconds before it vomited. A flood of human fingers and eyes came pouring out of its mouth and onto the floor. The fingers twitched at first, then flexed and stood up on their own. Then red sinewy flesh erupted from behind them, and they came together to connect with at least one eyeball for each group on a swivel above it. The finger-eye creature things spread out onto the floor in every direction, including his. There was a soft pitter-patter of fingertips on concrete, that you could only really hear in the silence accompanying their walk. The whole thing was about the size of his fist, which he only knew because one was right at his feet. A fingernail dug into the cloth leg of his jumpsuit, and then another finger, and then another. 
first to his knee, then to his hip, and then it caught a loop on the vest he wore and swung itself up onto his arm. His hands were still in his pocket, one gripping the heavy flashlight about as tightly as he could without shaking. The finger thing continued to crawl up his arm, and he stood stone still until it was on his shoulder. The shallow breathing had stopped completely when it began to climb his neck. The fingers and fingernails couldn't find a purchase at all there, and they slowly kept alternately tickling him and scratching him. And then the eyeball stalk at the top of the finger thing slid itself along his neck, and Jeffrey Winters tried not to throw up. Then the sound of a chair moving in the office downstairs caught the main creature's attention. It growled. It turned, and it scurried down the stairs, and its finger monsters followed. Jeffrey Winters took his moment, ran across the dark hallway filled with monsters, and opened the door on the other side. He closed it as quickly as he could once he made it through, and then he turned and knocked a zombie to the ground as he began to run. The zombie didn't really do much other than groan and fall over. There were crisscrossed stitches all along the skull of the thing, though it still wore the lab coat of a Foundation doctor. It was still recognizably human. It rolled on the floor, and then it rose to its feet after several tries. Jeffrey pulled the heavy flashlight out of his pocket and raised it to strike. Wait came an almost ethereal voice from across the room. Jeffrey looked up. He was in the cafeteria now. Rows and rows of tables and benches separated him from a tall man wearing a mask with a long beaked nose. It will not harm you. But who are you? D9341, are, are you one of the doctors? The man in the mask chuckled. Of a sort. Why are you here? I just want to find a safe place, preferably outside the site. Ah, uh, the grand plans of small men. Go. I will not stand in your way. Ah, uh, good? Jeffrey edged his way around the room, keeping his eyes on the doctor, before he was far enough away to pull out his map. The exit was actually three floors up, with no direct access available from this floor. He'd need to go down two more floors before he could access a safe exit. What a horribly designed sight. Absorbed as he was in the map, he hadn't noticed the doctor begin to approach. He looked up to see the man about two tables away now, looking directly at him. How is it that you are free of the pestilence? Excuse me? The pestilence. It has been present in everyone I've encountered so far, except for you. I don't know what you're talking about. What pestilence? The great pestilence. Surely you must know of it. It permeates this place, soaks into every crack and seam. Yet you are free of its influence. You are cured. Look, I just want to get out of here. I don't really have time for one moment. The zombie Jeffrey had ran into as he entered the room snapped its head to look at him, and a half dozen other bodies he hadn't seen rose up from the ground and began to walk towards him. I must examine you, determine how you have been cured. Jeffrey balled up the map and put it into his pocket. Then he flipped the table in front of him. He ran around the edge of the room. The dead men and women following him were fast, but they weren't as agile as he was. They tried to climb over tables and benches, and simply found themselves caught, slowing them down while they extricated themselves. The whole room was filled with groaning monsters, as the doctor with the beak mask tried to cut him off from the door. Jeffrey looked directly at the doctor, thought for a moment, and decided to take a gamble. I need to get the cure out of this facility. It's dangerous here, and I could die with it. Surely you don't want that. The zombies all stopped and looked at the doctor, who also stopped. Grander plans still, the doctor said. Very well. Jeffrey bolted for the door, and he shut it behind him. And that's it. Another survival. Truth be told, SCP-049 isn't super dangerous, so this wasn't an entirely outrageous outcome to expect. Well, I, I guess I mean, 
he is dangerous, but not 682 dangerous. Anyway, you guys get to decide who he tries to survive next. Just a reminder, by the way, these are not death matches. The D-Class is entirely outclassed here. Him winning is surviving. You're just voting on who he's going to survive next. And by the way, I make no guarantees that the D-Boy at the center of these stories will actually make it through these stories. That's entirely up to how I see it going. So if you were to pit him against something particularly dangerous, he's probably going to die. Just keep that in mind. The poll for this week will be on Twitter, like always, with a link in the description and a pinned comment. The options are going to be SCP-106 and SCP-789-J. That's right. You can vote for either the old man or the butt ghost. I regret nothing, and somehow also everything. Anyway, that's it for this week. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode, and if you really want to help out, Head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dsumerian like the folk you see on the screen already have. Financial support is what helps me make sure I can keep making this content for you. Without your support, these videos won't happen. I appreciate it immensely, and I want to thank each and every one of you who have already become a patron. As for the rest, thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you soon.